Despite all of your advice, I am still being hunted. I wasn't in my new hotel room for more than a few hours before the church found me. Two burly men came pounding on my door in the middle of the night, threatening to kill me if I didn't turn over the laptop. Luckily, the window behind my bed was unlocked, and I was able to escape into a nearby alleyway just before they came barreling through the door. Thank God their attempt to apprehend me was so sloppy. If they would have pounced on me in the hall or snuck up on me next time I'd entered the parking lot, I'm sure I would have been overpowered. Dad, I'll be so lucky next time, though. Well, although these men were amateur in their approach, I cannot expect my next assailants to be so haphazard. I need to be a lot more careful, or the archive will never reach the public's eyes. How is the church locating me so easily? I ditched my phone, I'm only using cash, and stored all of the archival data on an external hard drive to avoid using the laptop, just like you all recommended. Do you suppose that the simple act of possessing the laptop might be leading the church to me? Is it possible that there's some hidden tracking device on it? I'll be honest, I'm not an expert when it comes to these matters. I'm relying on all of your expertise to help me through this dangerous time. Without your help, I doubt I would have made it this far. A fact I'm truly grateful for. Hopefully, I'll find shelter soon. As it stands, I'm taking shelter in a local library so I can post this undetected. I'll be in touch. The document that I'm about to leak contains sensitive information regarding extraterrestrials. It has languished in the Vatican's secret archive for 100 years and was written by an American priest named Father Jonathan Brown. This document represents the final record of Father Brown's life. He disappeared without a trace shortly after his completion. March 1st. I've been having the same strange dream recently. I'm laying face down on a metal table, paralyzed and on the verge of suffocating. On the floor around me I can see strange shadows undulating like snakes. These shadows are fluid and form incomprehensible shapes impossible to describe. Although my body is numb, as if it's been given a sedative, I can feel the faint impression of something sharp digging into my back. However, I always awake before I can determine the origin of this sensation. March 2nd Jeremiah Cotterell, a farmer who lives at the edge of the county and is well respected throughout the parish, visited me today. I told him about the dreadful dream I've been having. Much to my surprise, he complained of experiencing this same dream. And so, I had him lift his shirt. Dark blue lines spanned the entirety of his back. March 4th. My congregation was in an uproar today, preventing me from conducting mass. All everyone could talk about was the dream spreading like wildfire through the parish, and the strange markings lining our back. I tried my best to calm everyone down. However, my voice was drowned out by panicked cries and exasperated voices. Eventually, Mr. Mathers, the oldest farmer in the parish, threw himself in front of the crowd, eyes wild. This has happened to our community before, he said, voice trembling with emotion. When I was a boy, only 30 of us lived in these parts at the time, but all of us experienced the same dream every night for two weeks. This dream was similar to the one we're discussing now, but with one exception. None of us woke up with markings on our backs. What do the markings mean? asked Mrs. Dempsey, a school teacher. Are they dangerous? Only God can say. All I know is the last time this happened, half the parish disappeared. Why haven't you told anyone this? said Mr. Pitt, the butcher. Why aren't there any records of such a terrible tragedy? I don't know, said Mr. Mallards. I've only just remembered. I feel like a fog is lifting from my mind, as if I spent the past sixty years wandering around in a stupor. March 6th. Mr. Pitt's son, Michael, was murdered yesterday. 
The parish is torn apart by his death. Michael was a good boy and was doted upon by everyone in the community. He didn't deserve to die, especially in such a sadistic way. Michael's body was found two miles outside of town, pinned to a sprawling oak tree by four knives. Dry blood covered his body, making him look phosphorescent in the dusk. His eyes were still open. March 7th. Mr. Mathers was arrested today for murdering Michael. He confessed to the crime himself through a letter he hand-delivered to the constable and is now being held in a local jail. This letter is harrowing. I cannot sleep for his words ring through my head like shotgun blasts. Here's the letter. I'm sure all of you are wondering why I killed our dear Michael. I can assure you that I didn't come to this decision lightly, but only after much prayer and deliberation. The parish is in dire peril. It's only through difficult decisions such as the one I've just made that we will survive the spring. In short, please don't judge me until you hear my tale. If after hearing what I have to say you choose to condemn me, then I will tie my own noose. Three days ago an object I don't know what else to call it, fell from the sky and crashed into my cornfield. This object was about two feet in circumference, a perfect sphere, so black it consumed the light around it. I hunkered over it, trying to guess at its origin. However, no matter how hard I examined it, its surface morphed every time I blinked, causing me to lose focus. After staring at it for several minutes, melted soil pooling around my feet in muddy streams. I decided to return to my house to grab my shovel so I could move it without scolding my hands. I figured the professors at Harvard would be interested in purchasing it, since my father taught me never to turn my back on a quick dollar. I thought that I might make the delivery the following morning. Michael came barreling through the corn in front of me just as I was turning around to leave. His arms were filled with apples he'd stolen from my orchard. He jumped and raised his hands the moment he saw me, sending the apples plummet into the ground. Oh, Mr. Mathers, he said, voice rushed. I was just... The object leapt from the mud and engulfed his head like a widow's shroud. He flailed his arms and crashed to the ground, shrieks muffled by the gelatinous substance now seeping into his mouth. Before I had time to process what was happening, much less span the distance between us. The object disappeared down his throat. He writhed on the ground as his throat swelled to twice its normal size, and then fell still. Michael, I yelled. I hobbled through the mud and knelt beside him. Just as I was about to lower my ear to his mouth to check if he was still breathing, he let forth a guttural scream and jumped to his feet. Fear constricted my chest as I reared backward, head crashing into the nearby cornstalks. I watched in terror as Michael's skin fluctuated in color between purple and black. Blood poured from his eyes in thick streams and bloomed across his white shirt like ink spilled in water. Now foam spewed from his mouth, and his bowels released. A few moments later, Michael's skin returned to its normal white and he opened his eyes. They were a deep red and gazed upon me with such malice that my lungs seized. He was on me before I had time to address him, snarling like a feral animal. Blood roared in my ears as he pounced on me. He drove his fist into my temple, sending bright colored stars dancing across my eyes. Gore crashed from his tear ducts and onto my forehead filling my nose with the smell of iron. I kicked Michael in the groin, for I knew not what else to do. He howled and tumbled to the ground beside me. Seizing my opportunity, I pulled myself to my feet and drove the heel of my boot into his chin, knocking him unconscious. I gazed down at the poor boy, lamenting his fate. If he'd taken any other path through the corn, then this situation could have been avoided. However, he had stumbled upon the object, which proved to be the costliest mistake of his life. 
knowing that it was too dangerous to bring Michael into town. I wrapped my arms around his chest and began to drag him through the corn towards my house. As you all know, I'm an amateur taxidermist, so I have a basic knowledge of anatomy. Well, I vowed to extract the creature tainting Michael's body using any means necessary. I placed Michael on the table next to my taxidermy tools. His shallow breathing echoed throughout the house like a stalling motor, sending chills rippling down my back. Congealed blood lined his eyelids, and vomit covered his chest. I flipped him onto his back to examine the markings etched into his flesh. Much to my surprise, they'd morphed from static blue to a pulsating red. They looked alive, as if they'd grown lungs and were sucking in air with glutinous fervor. I thought of the gelatinous substance lurking inside his body, and shivered. After staring down at Michael's frail frame for several minutes, straining to develop a plan, I decided to first locate where the vile substance had taken final residence inside his body. Had it ventured all the way to his stomach, or was it still lurking in the back of his throat, waiting to develop the viscosity to slide down his esophagus? I wasn't sure, and would only find the answer to this pressing question through careful experimentation. So I rolled up my sleeves placed on my gloves and selected the finest knife in my arsenal. I wrapped my fingers carefully around the blade and prodded Michael's throat with the hilt. His throat remained still, leaving me to assume that the substance had travelled deeper into his body. Oh, the thought of that pulsating blackness undulating through his stomach acid or chest cavity oh, made my temples throb. After taking a deep breath to calm my roaring heart, I poked Michael's chest. Other than the gentle rising and falling of his sternum, his flesh remained static. If I hadn't witnessed his gruesome transformation in the cornfield, I would have thought him to be asleep. His face looked so peaceful and so young that innocence trailed his every breath. However, I knew better than to let my guard down, for at any moment he could resume his fiendish assault and explode my skull on the corner of the table. So I pushed his face from my mind and focused on his stomach. What should have been no larger than two fists had swollen to the size of a fetus. How had I missed his bloated flesh? I don't know. Regardless, it became obvious to me where the substance now resided. So I straightened my gloves and lowered my knife. Just as I was about to cut a small incision above his belly button... Michael opened his eyes and shot up from the table. The speed with which his feet struck the ground sent me careening towards the door. He regarded me with contemptuous eyes that burned red with blood. I'm here to help you, Michael, I said. My voice came out surprisingly strong, given the fear coursing through my veins. You've been in an accident. Michael shifted his body toward the door, exposing his back. The line spanning his skin had widened, exposing his sordid flesh. Can you hear me? I can hear you, said Michael. His voice was unnaturally deep, as if he'd aged forty years. But I won't be able to for much longer. Before I had an opportunity to ask him what he meant, he bolted from the house on silent feet and disappeared into the murky dusk. Well, Despite my fatigue, I pursued him with vigor. For all I knew, Michael's affliction was contagious and could spread to others should he reach the town. Despite knowing now that this is not the case, at the time I was ignorant of the true nature of the substance controlling his body and vowed to recapture him using any means necessary. Now that I am aware of the horrors this substance can commit, I wish I would have killed him sooner. By doing so, I might have prevented what happened next. However, this is only conjecture. The poor boy's fate might have been sealed the moment the substance cleared his lips. If this is the case, then God have mercy on his soul, and on us all. I overtook Michael in a clearing dominated by a single, sprawling oak tree. I tackled him to the ground, driving the oxygen from his lungs. Stop struggling, I said. You're not yourself. 
but I can't help you. Michael howled like a wounded animal. Blood poured from his eyes in thick streams, coating the surrounding grass. Please, calm down. You're starting to... He punched me in the stomach. The air flooded from my lungs as I collapsed to the ground. I screamed as he jumped on top of me and inched his teeth toward my jugular. His fetid breath crashed into my nose, causing me to gag and nearly release my grip on his shoulders. Fearing that my strength might cave at any moment, I pulled a knife from my waistband and drove it into his arm, pinning him to the nearby oak tree. I shrieked in pain, but... To my surprise, not a single drop of blood spilled from his lacerated skin. It was as if his veins were completely empty, and the blood pouring from his eyes was materializing from the misty air. Michael tried to pull the knife from his arm. However, the blade had cleared the trunk all the way to the hilt, preventing him from working it free. Listen to me, I said, crouching by his feet. You're sick, but if you can hear me... Please, calm down. I don't want to hurt you, Michael. I want to help you. He placed his chin on his collarbone. I can feel it moving inside me, he said, voice normal for the first time in hours. Leave me here. I'm too dangerous to walk free. No, don't say that. I can't help you. Just as Michael was opening his mouth to respond... A spasm passed through his body so intense I could see his muscles cramping beneath his skin. He arched his body toward the starless sky and screamed as his back split open, revealing a creature so grotesque it stole the air from my lungs. I watched in terror as this creature scrambled from his back and beelined across the clearing towards the town. And for this reason, I'm writing this letter. To warn all of you about the horrors to come. This creature may be in town now, waiting for the perfect moment to claim its next victim. Only by banding together will we survive this nightmare. John Mathers March 8th Word of Mr. Mathers' letter has circulated through town, stirring panic and confusion. Normally such outlandish words would be decried for lunacy. However, given the marking spanning our backs, his claims seem not only possible, but probable. Regardless, the police chief has decided to keep Mr. Mathers under lock and key. His imprisonment is part punishment for slaying the boy and part protection from the hysteria his letter is causing. In other words, the townsfolk would swarm the old man the moment he exited his jail cell. Some to ask questions, some to condemn his crime, and others to blame him for their afflictions. As for myself, I don't know what to think of the old dog's letter. Only time will tell if such a horrid creature as he describes is lurking in our midst. I pray that this knowledge doesn't come too late. March 9th Matilda Wainwright and Jeremiah Smith were found dead on their farms this morning by their families. Their backs were split open, just like Michael's. You can imagine the stir that this is causing in the community. The sense of dread rippling throughout the countryside is incapacitating. All everyone can talk about are the horrid creatures rumored to be gathering in the forest and the dreadful marks encircling their backs. Regarding these rumors, I personally believe them to be false. God would never allow such abominations to wreak havoc on our land. Although I cannot explain the events of the past few days, as a man of the cloth, I refuse to accept these ramblings as anything other than nervous gossip. But then Mr. Mather's jarring letter comes hurtling back to the forefront of my mind, causing me to doubt even my faith. Is the taxidermist telling the truth? Did he truly witness poor Michael undergo such a horrifying transformation? Only time will tell. For now I must calm my mind and retire to bed. Tomorrow is Sunday and I can already imagine the drama that will unfold during Mass. March 10th. That the congregation didn't come to blows last night is nothing short of a miracle. Tensions are running higher than I thought. 
who hadn't even ascended the pulpit before questions started flying and tempers started raging. We are all doomed, said Tabitha Wheatley, a governess no older than nineteen. The deaths of Miss Wainwright and Mr. Smith are proof that none of us are safe. We have all been marked by the beast, and when the beast marks you, not even God can save you. Her alarming words sent murmurs rippling through the pews. Blasphemy, said Mr. Pitt. He appeared to have already aged ten years, even though Michael's death had only been four days ago. My son was pure and in God's good grace. How dare you accuse him of being marked by the beast, or of any of us for that matter. We're a God-fearing town. Have been for decades. The men around him beat their fists against the pews in agreement. We have matters more urgent to deal with right now than guessing our afflictions origin, said Mr. Cotterill. There are strange creatures lurking in the forest as we speak, skin soaked with the blood of our loved ones. Whether they possess the minds of beasts or men is up for debate, but regardless, we know they are dangerous. We need to locate and destroy them before their ranks swell. Has anyone actually seen these creatures? said David Lincoln, another farmer. Because I sure as hell haven't, and I've been looking harder than anyone. I've seen them said Mrs. Blake, an old maid pushing eighty. From my porch, they six feet long and slither across the ground like snakes. Oh, quit lying. Everyone knows you got too many screws loose to be trusted as an eyewitness. I knows what I've seen, and no one can take that away from me, not even you. She stood up on unsteady legs and addressed the congregation. This town's no longer safe. I can hear these creatures slaughtering deer every night from my room. It's not long before they venture out of the forest. Mark my words. Who cares what may or may not be in the forest? said Tabitha. What about the creatures inside our backs? That's where they're coming from, right? Not necessarily, said Mr. Pitt. Mr. Mathers said in his letter that a substance slid down Michael's throat before the creature exploded from his back. Now, this can't be a coincidence. Unless we've all had similar encounters, we should be safe. Yeah, but for how long? For all we know, a similar substance can travel down our throats while we sleep or attack us randomly like Michael. Like I said, this town is no longer safe. We should flee here while we still have the chance. What, and abandon our farms? said Mr. Lincoln. My granddad would roll in his grave. I was born on my land, and God willing, I'll die there too. The farmers sitting around him clapped their hands and slapped his back. Fearing that the situation would soon slip from my control, I banged my fist on the podium. Luckily, the congregation fell silent. It's obvious that the past few days have frightened us, I said. However, now is not the time to turn against one another. We are all a part of God's family. We must stand united if we're to overcome this challenge. What do you suggest, Father? said Mr. Cotterell. You've been surprisingly quiet on the subject. The congregation stared at me expectantly, eyes glowing in the morning sun drifting through the stained glass windows. Well, to start, we should all remain in our homes as much as possible. All three deaths this week have occurred on secluded farmland. Although I know we all want to protect our crops, our lives are more important than this year's harvest. Murmurs of approval rippled throughout the pews. I breathed a sigh of relief. I had worried that they would object to isolating themselves. That at least gave me hope that rationality hadn't fallen victim to panic. At least, not yet. What about the creatures? said Tabitha. Are they real? I remained silent for several moments, straining under the weight of their collected gazes. If I didn't choose my words carefully, then I could spark a wildfire where now there were only embers. I'm not sure, I said. Although the rumors sound like outlandish stories, too many lives have been lost to simply brush them off. For this reason, I think we should assemble a small party of men, myself included, to scout the woods. That's the only way to test the veracity of these tales, including Mr. Mather's letter. OK, 
count me in, said Mr. Pitt, rising to his feet. I'm the best shot within a hundred miles. If these creatures truly exist, then I'll put a bullet between their eyes. I'll go too, said Mr. Lincoln. You won't find me carrying in my bed while these bloodsuckers pick us off one by one. No, sir, I'd rather put my shotgun to use. The congregation exploded with cheers. Even I couldn't help but smile at Mr. Lincoln's courage. But just as I was about to raise my hands to quiet everyone down, the mayor, a hulk of a man named Bill Danforth, came bursting into the sanctuary. His sudden appearance shocked everyone into silence. His wife had contracted tuberculosis several weeks ago, preventing him from regularly attending Mass. Mr. Danforth, I said, what a wonderful surprise. He ignored me, and instead addressed the congregation with wild eyes. The cemetery, he said, voice shaky. It's empty. Every body, three hundred by my count has been dug up. Somebody broke into my hotel room last night. Fortunately, I was out eating dinner, so I'm unharmed. Rest assured, the laptop is still in my possession. I have it well hidden. The church will have to step up their game in order to steal it back from me. The documents in the archive are too important for me to give it up without a fight. Given that my hotel room is compromised, I'm scrambling to find a safer location. I'm currently squeezed onto a bus as I type this, praying that I'll arrive at my destination safely. My life is taking a dangerous turn. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that I'd be hunted by such a powerful institution. For this reason, I need all of your advice. What recommendations do you have for traveling undetected? Any thoughts you can give me on navigating the perilous path I've embarked upon, anything will be much appreciated. If all goes well, my life will calm down enough tomorrow for me to continue my tale. Documents from the archive are coming soon. Thanks to everyone who's following this, your support means everything to me. The next document that I'm about to leak contains sensitive information regarding life after death. It is written by a suburban dad named Nate Spangler, who hung himself in his basement last year. He died with a smile on his face. My house has fallen into such disrepair that even my counselor is repulsed by it. Piles of junk undulate to the ceiling which emanate fumes so noxious I have to wear surgical masks just to breathe. However, my basement is empty. Not a single box or trash bag lines its concrete floor. The reason for this is simple. I refuse to go down there. Although my addiction compels me daily to travel down the worn wooden steps, my will to live outweighs this compulsion. The horrors that dwell in its shadowed corners would cause even an exorcist to tremble and drove my wife from our home years ago. If I wasn't so frightened, I'd set up security cameras along the walls to catch the dreadful phenomena that occurs daily on camera. For maybe then, somebody wiser than myself could explain to me what on the surface seems unexplainable. However, given that my fear prevents me from even venturing near the door, my words will have to suffice. If you have any advice for me, please give it. I'm worried that the sinister forces in my basement are tainting the entire house. Should this happen, I don't know what I'll do. This house is my life. I have too many memories here to abandon it without a fight. However, I don't know how much more fight I have left in me. My wife, Melissa was the first person to grow weary of the basement. Upon moving into our house, long before my hoarding started, she complained of hearing footsteps during the night. These sounds occurred between 3 and 4 a.m. and prevented her from sleeping. For this reason, she quickly became concerned. I'm telling you, Nate, she said one morning, there's something down there. I believe you, I said. I've just never heard the noises you're describing. 
Do you think we have rats? Unless these rats wear size 12 shoes, I doubt it. I think there's a person down there. Sometimes when I pass the door, I hear whispering, and other times I hear raspy breathing, as if somebody is moments away from suffocating. I cast my eyes towards the ground, unsure how to respond. She'd made similar complaints of our last home. Eventually her fear grew to the point that I agreed to move. I did this no questions asked, for she was, and still is, the love of my life. However, I was hesitant to jump down that rabbit hole in our current house. We'd only been living there for a few weeks. For the first time since our wedding, I questioned her mental health. I don't know what to tell you, Melissa, I said, forcing myself to make eye contact with her. I've been down in that basement dozens of times. There's nothing down there except musty boxes and rusty pipes. Melissa placed her head on my shoulder. You're right. I'm sure I'm worrying about nothing. This house is beautiful. Let's forget about that smelly old basement. And forget about that basement we did until one night I awoke to the sound of footsteps drifting under the door. I nudged Melissa awake. Listen, the footsteps you described are back. We were silent for over a minute, listening to the heavy thumping of walking feet. What should we do? asked Melissa. I lowered myself from the bed and put on my shoes. I'm going to see who's down there. This is unacceptable. Wait! She pushed off the covers. I'm going with you. I don't want you to go alone. Are you sure? If somebody's truly in our basement, they might be dangerous. Bare minimum, they're mentally unstable. I'm sure. We're a team. Always have been, always will be. We walked into the hallway on silent feet and approached the basement door. The moment I placed my hand on the handle, the footsteps stopped. My heart pounded against my chest wall with such force that my ribs ached. Why had the footsteps stopped so suddenly? Was the intruder aware of our presence? The thought of them hiding in a darkened corner, waiting to pounce on us as we descended the stairs, filled me with dread. Melissa placed a reassuring hand on my elbow and nodded her head. I nodded back and then swung open the door. A wave of darkness assaulted my senses. Other than my shallow breathing, not a sound could be heard in the entire house. I flipped on my flashlight, illuminating a narrow set of worn wooden stairs. I ignored the light switch to my left. Given how busy I was following the move, I hadn't got around to changing the basement's dead light bulbs. For this reason, we were forced to venture into the suffocating darkness with nothing but a dim flashlight to guide our steps. The stairs creaked as we walked. Blood roared in my ears as we reached the final step. I swung my flashlight around the cluttered room. What I saw sent me careening into the wall. A woman was crouched in the corner, forehead pressed against the wall. The sound of my flashlight striking the concrete made her turn around. I stared into her face and screamed when I saw Melissa staring back at me. My scream reverberated off the concrete walls like a gunshot. I turned and looked at my wife, the real Melissa, before staring back into the bloodshot eyes of her doppelganger, for I no, nor what else to call such a logic-defying entity. Stephanie? said Melissa, voice shaking. My blood turned to ice. You know her? I said. Melissa ignored me. What are you doing here? I thought you were dead. Stephanie regarded her with a look of strained recognition. Hey, sis she said. Her voice was just above a whisper, but wound through the room with unnatural volume. I've missed you. A heavy silence descended over the basement. A thousand questions lined my throat, but I decided to keep my mouth shut. 
Melissa seemed to be in control of the situation. Best let her take the lead. Don't be frightened, said Stephanie, taking a step towards us. Her knees wobbled as she walked, as if her bones were broken. I just wanted to see you. This is impossible, said Melissa. You died right out of the womb. You're right. I did. But then I grew up in hell. And now. I've escaped. Oh, I need your support now more than ever. I've been getting flooded with messages today from Vatican run accounts demanding that I terminate this page. These messages, which I plan on sharing sooner, are becoming increasingly threatening and have me constantly looking over my shoulder. As a result, my stress and paranoia are becoming almost unbearable got a good night's sleep in days. Despite my perilous situation, I'll continue posting. My cause is too important to give up without a fight. I have too much to share with you all to disappear so suddenly. The last time I touched base, I was in a small town library. I've since moved even further off the grid and I'm now in a nameless hotel in a nameless city off a nameless highway. I'm using a secure internet connection, at least I hope as I type this while laying in a fresh, or slightly lumpy bed. To the forces trying to capture me, good luck finding me. Now that I know you're monitoring this account, I'll do everything in my power to not only slander your names, but to make your lives a living hell. I'm not someone to trifle with. Do not test me. I don't know about you lot, but I'm really, really enjoying these stories. Um, all kind of unique in their own way, but coming together to form part of a bigger picture. The Vatican Archivist. So, so very, very happy that I've been allowed to read these stories. Again, links in the video description, and uh, I'll post a comment as well. Linking to his subreddit and his YouTube channel. Go and check them out, because as you can tell, um, there were kind of uh, interjections in tonight's video. Um, it's kind of the ongoing story of his attempts to keep his work safe and everything, but also the uh, case files as well. So I just really like the format of this and I think it's very, very enjoyable. Hope you agree. If so, comments in the comment section below the vid. I, of course, will be back again very, very soon, my dear friends. Till then, sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.